Hey everyone, let's make a StarCraft 2 map. In the last episode, we implemented our basic attack for our hero. Now we're going to add on to the functionality of the basic attack by incorporating an accuracy and recoil system. This will allow the map to have more skillful play than if we just left it as is. But before we get into that, let's talk about more theory. In the last episode, we also talked about the concept of fun and what it is according to me. Now I'm gonna build on to that. There's really no arguing that the best games out there are the ones that are easy to learn and hard to master. Now here's the question. What makes a game easy to learn and hard to master? Let's start with the learning part. It's a really simple concept. We all know it as the learning curve. And what this is, is knowledge. How much you need to know in order to play the game. Of course, you need to work for that knowledge, so ultimately, the learning curve represents how much effort you need to put into the game before you can play it properly. You don't need to know everything about the game, just the basics. This includes the game mechanics, the rules of the game, the controls, and stuff like that. It's pretty simple stuff, but what makes a game hard to master? This is also simple. This is known as the skill cap. It's the amount of skill a player can have at a game. A high skill cap means there's lots of room to grow and improve yourself as a player of that game. The higher your skill level, the harder it is to improve, hence it's harder to master. So essentially, the best games are the ones that have a very simple learning curve and a very high skill cap. Now let me give you some examples of games that are easy to learn and hard to master. And they are games like StarCraft, Counter-Strike, Street Fighter 4, you know, games like that. Games which are easy to learn the basics, but hard enough that you need a lot of skill to be better than other players. And it's not even limited to video games. It can be games like chess and poker. Also think about the sports that you played in gym class. Games like basketball, baseball, football, and soccer. These are also games that are easy to learn and hard to master. It's easy enough that your teacher can teach you how to play within a few minutes, and hard enough to master that there are professional players out there earning millions of dollars a year just to play the game. Again, the best games are the ones that are easy to learn and hard to master, and that's what makes them so popular. It's because they have a simple learning curve and a very high skill cap. Now let's look at games that stray away from this. How about games that are easy to learn and easy to master? These are what we refer to as casual games. Think of Wii Sports. How easy is it to learn these games? Well, they're very simple. All you need to do is swing the remote as it's instructed on the screen, and you're playing the game. But the game is also easy to master, because once you learn the basics, really, what else is there to learn? The casual games are meant for casual players. They're people who don't want to spend a lot of time learning how to play these games, and they're also not interested in being very good at these games either. So now let's look at the other side of the coin. Games that are hard to learn and hard to master. I did say I would frequently bring this up throughout the entire series, and this is one such moment. Let's talk about Dota. This is a game that's hard to learn and hard to master. Why? It has a vast amount of information you need to learn in a short period of time. There's over a hundred heroes in the game, and over 50 items and recipes you need to learn about. You need time to figure out what items go best with your hero, and that's time you don't have. The time you spend reading information is time supposed to be spent gaining experience and making your hero stronger. Then there's the players themselves, who don't really like newbies in their games. But considering that, it just takes much more time and effort, more so than other games, to learn how to play Dota. Once you learn everything, you'll find that it has a very high skill cap. And this is what draws a lot of players to it. And going back to what my definition of fun is, this relates to the three types of fun. The discovery, the substance, and the accomplishment. Discovery is in the learning curve. It's fun to try new things, but if it requires too much effort to learn, the player will lose interest and stop playing. 
substance and accomplishment fall into the skill cap. Once you learn how to do everything, it all comes down to refining your skills in the game. You've already learned the game mechanics, now you need to be able to play better than your opponent. And if you have better skills than your opponent, you're going to win. And that's fun. But if you lose, you can learn from them and improve your own skills, and therefore your skills will go up. So the process of playing a game becomes a battle of learning and mastering skills. Remember that games are a form of interactive entertainment. You're entertained by participating in the action. And in order to participate in the action, you need to learn skills. And you need to refine these skills and become better. Everyone likes a challenge. And this is why I am incorporating the accuracy and recoil system. What this is going to do is make the map harder to master. Rather than spray bullets everywhere, you have to fire controlled bursts. Of course, we need to make sure that this system is easy to learn and hard to master. It's very complex in the background, but to the average player, it's going to be extremely simple to understand. The first thing we need to do is devise a way to keep track of everything. So for this, I created what is referred to as an Entity Relationship Diagram. This is something you learn how to do in computer science. And this allows me to keep track of how everything is related to each other. So far, I only have three tables here. The first is the gun types. It tells the game how much ammo a gun will have, uh, its base accuracy, its recoil, uh, the rate of fire, and even its name and uh, description of it. The next one is the guns table. You can consider these the guns themselves and the current state they're in during the game. It's going to contain how much ammo it has left, its current recoil, uh, the movement penalty, but most importantly, it remembers what kind of gun it is. And finally, we have the player stats. This will keep track of what the player has. It's going to keep track of what weapon you currently have selected and things like your kill death ratio. For the purposes of this episode, we only need to worry about the selected weapon, which of course we only have one weapon defined, so that's all you need to focus on. And of course, if you don't understand this diagram at all, don't worry about it. You don't need to know this. I'm just showing this for the curious. And of course, someone's going to mention how I drew the diagram wrong. It's actually been a while since I've done something like this, so if it's wrong, then it's wrong. The only thing I care about is that I understand this, and I could use it to keep track of what I'm doing. Now let's move on to the triggers. For this episode, we're just going to be looking at the trigger editor. Now, I've created three new folders. The loops, which is going to contain what is called the gun loop. The map initializations, which will load all the variables into memory when the map loads. And the HUD, which stands for Heads Up Display. This is going to contain functions for updating all the values you see on the screen. These are all going to be containing supporting triggers and functions for our main trigger. So what we're going to do now is add more functionality to the hero's basic attack. I prefer to create triggers using Galaxy Script, which is the scripting language for StarCraft II triggers. It's similar to C Sharp, which is a language I'm very familiar with, but I haven't memorized all the functions for the triggers yet, so what I do is I create disabled actions and then copy the functions into the custom script and then work with it from there. So the trigger we're going to be working on is called Use Current Weapon. This is the main trigger, and this runs when a player left clicks on the screen. So you can probably guess what this does. This is the trigger that fires the bullets. Now I'm going to walk you through the trigger. The first thing the trigger does is it gathers information and stores it into local variables. And that information includes the player that fired the weapon, the player's position on the map, the position of the map you clicked on, and to make things easier, we're also going to store the gun fired and the type of gun. Storing it in these local variables makes it easier to work with later on in the trigger. The next thing we're going to do is check if the hero is already attacking. And the reason we do this is because we don't want duplicate bullets firing. 
Like, it's gonna look like it's firing two or three guns at a time, and we don't want that. So if the hero is already attacking, we're gonna skip everything. But if the hero is not already attacking, we're gonna make him attack. So the next thing we do here is we prepare the attack. We're gonna create a dummy unit at the player's position. This dummy unit is what's actually going to fire the bullets. And we're also going to set some global variables to let other triggers know that the hero is attacking. Next on list, we check if the gun is semi-automatic. This is a value for each gun type. This is going to determine if it's automatic, where holding down the mouse button will repeatedly fire bullets, or if it's semi-automatic, where it's one shot per click. At the moment, we only have one gun, and it's automatic. But we need this condition because eventually we're going to put in some semi-automatic pistols. After that, we're going to enter a loop. And what's going to happen here is, it's going to check if the left mouse button is pressed. And it's going to run all of this code repeatedly until the left mouse button is let go. So, what exactly happens here? First, it's going to update the position of the hero. And the reason we do that is because you can fire while moving. So every bullet that's fired, you need to update the position of the hero or else the bullets will just appear in one spot whether the hero is there or not. And this looks really awkward. And not just looks, it's also going to affect the gameplay since you'll have bullets appearing out of nowhere if the hero is moving. We don't want that. The next thing it does is it plays the attack animation of the hero. Not only does this look cool, but this is also a visual cue even if you don't see the bullets, you can tell from looking at the hero where the hero is firing. Next, we calculate the accuracy. This is based on the base accuracy of the gun, the movement penalty from moving, and the current recoil from the gun. Using the information we have so far, we're going to determine where the bullet actually goes. And then comes the good part. We actually fire the bullet. It goes flying off, hitting whatever it comes across. But we're not done yet. Next, we're going to calculate the recoil. And this is going to be added on to the current recoil of the gun. Only a small amount of recoil will be added if you don't have a lot of recoil to begin with. This is going to make the first few shots extremely accurate, but it's going to make any successive shots after the first few rounds extremely inaccurate. Finally, we wait. This is where the trigger does nothing for a certain amount of time. In this case, the time is based on the gun's rate of fire. And that's it for the current loop. Afterwards, it's gonna check again. Is the left mouse button still pressed? If it is, it's gonna go through the loop again. It's gonna update the player's position, it's gonna play the attack animation, calculate accuracy, fires the bullet, and then calculate recoil, and then wait again. And it keeps doing this until the left mouse button is released. And that's it for the main trigger. This trigger is run each and every single time a player presses the left mouse button. It took minutes to explain, but with the exception of the wait function, this trigger actually takes nanoseconds to process. The average player will never see or think about what's happening in the background. The only thing they will care about is that a hero is firing bullets. However, the trigger by itself will not function correctly. It needs supporting triggers. Remember the global variables we set earlier? The supporting triggers are going to use it, as well as the tables I've shown you earlier. The gun types, the guns, and the player stats, these are also global variables, and these supporting triggers can also access it. So let's take a look at the other triggers. The next one is called Stop Firing. This trigger runs when you let go of the left mouse button. And the purpose of this trigger is to tell the other triggers that the player let go of the left mouse button. As you can see, it's only a single line, but that's really all it needs. Remember the loop in the main attack trigger? This trigger allows the main trigger to exit that loop and stop firing. The next trigger we have is called Update Player Attack Point. This runs when you move the mouse while you're attacking. That is, when the main trigger is in the loop. What this trigger does is it tells it where the player is aiming. So when you're holding down the left mouse button, it's going to keep track of where the cursor is. So you can change where you're aiming while you're firing. 
The last trigger we have is the gun loop. This trigger is actually different from the rest because this relies on a timer rather than the player interaction. This trigger runs every 50 milliseconds and it does two things. It reduces the current recoil of the gun and it calculates the movement penalty if your hero is moving. You'll also notice it's in a loop. That's because it does it for every single player in the game. In this case, we only have one player so far, so it's only going to do the calculations for one player. All of these supporting triggers go together with the main trigger to create the effect we're talking about here, and that is the accuracy and recoil system. So here's the results. You'll notice that controlled bursts are more accurate than continuously firing your weapon. You'll also notice that the movement affects accuracy. Even the controlled bursts are less accurate if you're moving than if you stand still. You'll also notice the accuracy bar in the middle of the screen. This is going to be part of the HUD. The numbers under the accuracy bar are just there to show you what the triggers are actually doing. The top number represents the movement penalty, and the bottom number represents recoil. These numbers are subtracted from the base accuracy of the weapon to calculate the final accuracy. As we go on, these numbers will continue to exist, but you won't see them. And this is what all these triggers do. It makes it harder for the players to actually fire their weapon, and that ultimately makes the game harder to master. The players who control their shots the best will have the advantage over the other players, and that's going to increase the skill cap. And that's it for the accuracy and recoil system, but we're not stopping there. As you can see, the hero has infinite ammo. What exactly is stopping a player from just holding down the left mouse button and just spraying bullets everywhere? All of these random shots will potentially hit something, and that's not good enough for me. We need to give players a reason to not fire. So in the next episode of Deep Blue, we're going to implement a system of ammunition and reloading. Every gun will have a limited number of shots before they need to reload. And this is going to further increase the skill cap because it gives players another thing to worry about. How much ammo do I have in my magazine? And when do I need to reload? This is also the last thing we need to implement to complete the core game mechanic and that is the player's ability to move and attack. Look forward to it!